let's take a look. So here's the quiz question. Number two is the quiz right there. So what's up with that question? Well, let's see. Part of a stat project, sixth grade teacher brings class 300, a um, container of 300 red, 500 white, which are thoroughly mixed. Uh, to figure out how many marbles in the container are red without actually counting them all, the student randomly draws 40. Of the 40, 16 are red, right? That's like sampling. That's what they do before a national election, right? They can't ask everybody, so they ask a group, and they hope that represents the whole. So this is what statistics is. It's one of the things it's about. Anyway, so here comes the question. The target population. So did everybody get that hand, those handouts from last time? Anybody not get that? Need, need any more of these from yesterday? Nobody got these? All right. So it says target on there. That was the very first thing. Target, the entire population about which we want to learn something. So um, target population means the, the goal of the study. So why are the kids pulling it out? It even says it. To figure out. How many marbles in the container are red? Right? To figure it out. So they're trying to figure out that the target population is the 800 marbles in the container, isn't it? Does that make sense? It's the goal of your study. It's what you're trying to figure out. That's always the target. Is that good? We all good? Would the sample be the 40 marbles? Yeah, so if we did, um, the, if they asked for the sample, yeah, question three, what's the sample? The sample is the 40, exactly, the 40 that they pulled out. That's right on. Yeah, it makes sense? So you always have the, the population is like the whole thing, and the sample is the small thing you take out of it. Yep, that's exactly right. Good. All right. So let's move ahead then. That test I just passed back, um, since we did have, since it was a little different, um, <laughs> Let me see, what was it? Oh, you saw the questions on the back that they graded by hand. Those were with 7 and 12, 12, 12, 12, or 3, 12, or 4, whatever. They're up there. The scan was were three points each. So you can see the, the stamp score at the bottom of your Scantron. Like if the Scantron says 11, like the machine stamped 11 correct, then I took that number times 3 because they were three points each. That would be 33. You'd see a 33 over there in your first page. And maybe, maybe the other part added up to be, I don't know what, 42, right? That was the, that was the non-Scantron total, right? The, the four 12s and a 7, right? I added those up, 75, then I added 5, because I always add 5, because multiple choice can be tricky. So that's what that all means. If you have any questions, grab me afterwards. be glad to... I've got all the answers and explain how everything uh, was done and graded, but I better move ahead at this point with this stuff. All right. So let's, let's go forward. So let's pick it up right there. Okay, so here we were. We were doing number two. See, we're supposed to get through. What are we supposed to do today? We're supposed to do, like, the rest of 13. Yeah. Maybe even start 14. I don't think that'll happen. But we're supposed to finish 13. All right, let's see what we can. This, this, is, a, this is a tricky chapter for people. You guys did pretty well on those... Um, What's it called? The uh, map it out. I think you may be the most successful I've had on um, scheduling. Remember, I made this big deal. Everybody misses these. That was good. That was good. You guys, most of you figured those out. Got a lot of points. Got a lot of right answers on the scheduling. That's good. This is another thing. Let me give you a heads up. This is another thing that kind of tricks me. Basically, exam four is actually some of the... I mean, it's not dramatic. It's close. It's not a dramatic thing. But it's usually a little lower than the others, if, if I remember right. And then five is the highest. Exam five is everybody's favorite exam. That's the easiest one. So people get their... So there's, there's hope coming. That exam five is the highest scores always. Now, material is just a little bit easier, I think, for people. Four looks kind of easy, but I think the words fool people. So it'll be good to take that practice exam before the real... But yeah, the words really fool people. So do your best to kind of hone in on those little words. They really move things on little words, you know. So, um, all right. So hopefully, I've never done the Praxam thing before, so maybe that'll really help, and you guys will do well on four as well. But I think this one is traditionally the lowest score by a little bit. It's not dramatic. All right. Anyway, where are we at? Project, blah, 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 gumballs, that whole same kind of thing. Question C, sampling air. So yeah, remember we were talking about an air. Get the deal, right? Like the, there's this big jar of marbles, red and greens, up they are, red and green. And um, 
The, pe the kids don't want to count, the teacher doesn't want to count the entire jar full of marbles, so they just try picking out a, a handful and, and look at their little handful. What they get? They got 40 gumballs in their little sample. This is their sample. And they found nine were red out of 40 total. If you do the percentage on that, two and a half, eight, is it 22.5% are red? Right? Good on that? So I just take red divided by total. So in their little sample, that'd be like asking people, who are you going to vote for at 22.5% and say they're going to vote for whomever, right? That's like polling, asking people ahead of time who they're going to vote for. That's what that sample is like, taking a little group at random, right? You don't look. You don't look at what you're doing. You just grab them at random, just like polling. Find 22.5% red. So you would predict, well, I think about 22.5% of the whole jar is red marbles, you're just guessing based on your sample. That's what polling does, right? They ask people who they're going to vote for, and they just assume that's representative of the whole country. So is that true? How close is that to reality? Well, in reality, this is the population. This is the truth. You know, the whole population tells the whole story. 50 are red out of 200 total, right? 50 red out of 200 total, total, right, which comes out to be 25%. So the truth is 25% of the entire jar is red, our, and 22.5% uh, of our sample came out red. So there's an error there. If we predicted based on our sample, we said, well, we think about 22.5% of the jar is going to be red, because that's what happened in our sample. The reality is 25%, it's pretty close, you know, 25% of the entire jar is red. In reality, what's the error? You just subtract them, right? The error is the difference. 2.5%. So that was this answer here. Here was the 25%. Um, oh, yeah. How, why, why is this the 25%? Question A. And not the 22.5%. How do you know when they want the 20 What is it? This, I think this is what conf confuses people. You know, the math isn't hard. Everybody, I know y'all can divide 50 over 200, you know, and whatever, 9 over 40. That's not the problem. The problem is those little words fool people. What words in question A, you're taking the exam, whatever that is, next Tuesday. Yeah, next Tuesday. What words in question A would let you know you've got to do 25 out of, I'm sorry, 50 out of 200, not the 9 out of 40? Parameter. Parameter. What, what, why? What does parameter mean? Remember? P, P. Parameter, population. Remember? Parameter goes with population. Sample goes with statistic. Remember that? You want to know SS and PP. SS and PP. Sample, a sample, a statistic comes from the sample. So this over here... This is a statistic, whereas this is a parameter. you got to really know those words. Does that make sense? Why? Because this parameter comes from the whole population, the whole thing, right? Whereas this statistic comes from the sample. It's just a guess. A statistic is a guess as to the real parameter, right? Okay, that's how we know. B, what's the sampling error? What's the error in our sample? We subtracted 2.5%. Now C, is the sampling error, like what happened? Why did we get an error? Why didn't we get perfect? Well, the error was caused by sampling variability, meaning, you know, it's just random. You just reach in, you grab, sometimes you get a few more red, a few less red. There's just randomness, simple random sampling. There's no selection bias. Like, we didn't go in and say, you know, I'm going to try to get red marbles. Right? There was no selection bias there, right? It was simple, random luck, basically, was the reason on that. Is that good? Are we okay with that? All right. So I went ahead so we could save time. I did this yesterday in my office so we don't have to keep going back and forth. There's, there they are. There's all the questions with the answers so we can just talk about it and be quick about it. So, 1280 students, high school, are having election homecoming king. Do they do that? Do they have homecoming king? The candidates are the captain of the football team, the class president, and a member of the marching band. At the football game, a week before the election, a pre-election poll was taken to the students as they entered the stadium gate. Right? They're doing a pre-election poll. 
It's called like a straw poll. Of the students who attended the game, 270 planned to vote for the football captain. 63 for the president, class president, 177 for the marching band. That was their plan. That was the poll taken ahead of time, right? Okay, give the sample statistics estimating the percentage of the vote going to each candidate. See the words SS? Right, there's PP and SS, right? Statistics come from samples. It's like a poll. And then like what Trump actually got, that's a parameter. What did he get, 48%, 49%? What Hillary actually got, that's a parameter, right? So what actually <coughs> happened when the whole vote came down, that's, those are parameters because those are for the whole population, but the polls that were done ahead of time, those were statistics from samples. Are we getting the difference? So, when they ask me for sample statistics, they're saying, yeah, take these little numbers that came out of that sample, right? As they, as they went into the football game the week before, they just asked people at the gate, who are you going to vote for next week when we have the actual homecoming king election? Who are you going to vote for? They took down the numbers. All right, here we go. So what percentage voted for the football captain? I don't know. 270 over whatever the total is, right? So it's just... Who voted? Yeah, out of all the voters, right, over the total. Right, yeah, it's always over the total who voted. Yeah, right, 270. So the total would be whatever, 270 plus 63 plus um, 117 is, which I didn't bring my calculator. Somebody have those numbers? Two seventy. Two seventy. 333, 433, 440, 450? Divide by 9, B3 fifths would be 60. Oh, yeah, that's obviously the answer, 60%. Yep, 60%. Point, point 0.60, which is 60%. Good, see how I'm doing that? So whenever they ask me a percentage, it's that over the total, isn't it? That's what it means to be a part of something, right? If I said, what percentage of this class is going to get A's? I think a chunk of you. So maybe 40%, 30%. That's the part over the whole, right? That's what percentage means. Class president. So then we just do, what, how many voted for president? Um, 63 over 450. And that, I guess, comes out to be the 14%. And then the marching band is whatever they were, 117 over the 450. And I guess that comes out 26%. You just round them. I want you to round them. Good how I'm doing that? We okay? Shall we move on? A week after the survey, the class president was elected homecoming king. Wait, who won? Class president. Class president. Is that who they predicted? <coughs> no. What did the poll ahead of time predict? So here's what we're really interested in. Good polls, wise polls and foolish polls, right? What did they predict in their poll? Football captain by far. How did they say the class president was going to do? Terrible, they thought. A week before. But in the actual election, look. Class president got, what does it say? A homecoming king, 54%. The other one's blah, blah, blah. And they ask us, uh, they say, what are the errors? So here's the reality. Or no, I mean, so, so yeah, let's compare. So I'm going to erase this if that's okay. Let's compare... The, uh, to find the error, remember how you always do the error? The, you just subtract reality from what they predicted. Just find the difference, right? If they said Trump's going to get 45%, he really got 48, that's a 3% error, right? That makes sense? Just reality compared to prediction, right? So, what, what, for the football captain, for, so here we go. So, so I'll do reality. And I'll do prediction, or prediction, or poll, same thing, you know, what they, what their poll, their sample. So reality for the football captain and the class president and the band person. For the football captain, the reality was what? Where is he? Oh, 20%? And the prediction was he'd get 60. So subtract that, the air. That's a 40% error, right? That's, that's bad, bad, bad polling, right? Class president, the reality was 54%. 
The prediction was only 14. That also is a 40% error. For the band member, I think they got it. Yeah, 26, 26. They had the band member right on the money. No error there. 0% error. See, so that's how I'm coming up with those errors. Error percentages. We good there? So error is just reality minus prediction. Now, let's stop a second. What we're really interested in, with the other questions, they're not asking it on this one, but they will on others and on the test. Why? Why the big error? Why do you think they're so far off? Maybe some people didn't go to the game. I did. Sure. We took out a football game. Why does that matter? Well, football fans are going to go, so they're going to vote for football players. Absolutely. Esmeralda's right of the money. Think about it. They took the poll, the survey, at the football game. Right? There's a lot of students that don't go to the football game. Right? They didn't get their opinion at all. They got a bunch of football fans' opinion on who they were going to vote for. Well, yeah, they like the football uh, captain. They're in the football. That's a stupid way to do a poll. Really, isn't it? That's as, that's as ridiculous as what the Literary Digest magazine actually did asking wealthy people, only, almost only wealthy people, who they were going to vote for. You're not going to get the true average opinion of the nation, and you're not going to get the true average opinion of the school if you just survey a certain kind of person at the school, especially when one of the candidates is a football player, right? And you're at the football game. So you see the idea? So we're trying to learn how to be wise in polling. And also, you guys may never conduct a poll, but we live in the information age. This, this, I think, is the most valuable chapter because we live in the information age. I mean, there is constantly information coming at you. And what you want to be is a discerning receiver of information. You want to know when info comes in and, and you can look at it and go, no, that's, that's, not, that's not been done wisely for the following reasons. Or, yeah, no, that's something I should believe. Those results have been studied carefully or prepared wisely. Right, that's what we're trying to do here is become a good consumer of information. All right, shall we move on with that? Thank you. Oh, you know what? I wonder if there was a... Here we go, yeah. Survey about extramarital affairs was conducted by a columnist. She asked her readers to let her know if they had been faithful or unfaithful in their marriages. The readers' responses are summarized in the table to the right. Complete parts A through C below. So, so we got... Men and women in their marriages, faithful or unfaithful. So the women, the men, faithful, unfaithful, total. This from the, so the, the call like Dear Abby or something like that, you know, um, ask their readers this question. Right. Based on the data, estimate the percentage of married men who are faithful to their spouses. So the percentage of married men who are faithful to their spouses. How do we do that? Percentage faithful. So what do we do? Yeah, it's always the part over the total, huh? So faithful men, that'd be the 45,778. Over the total men, 60,553. Divide those, get the 75.6 number after you move the decimal two places. Is that good? So all these percentage questions are just... Over the total. Is that good? And so then the next part, uh, estimate the percentage of married people. So now they want, so the first part A was men. And then part B is, is people in general. People. So for that, you got to add men and women, don't you? So you got to have uh, the what is it? The faithful women, 127, 317, plus the faithful men, 45, 778, over the total altogether, which is 149, 787, plus 60,553. And then divide that on your calculator. And then I guess you'll get the uh, 
0.3%. Is that good? Because they're talking people, so you've got to add men and women in those cases, right? Men and women faithful over men and women total. Right? Very good. Question C. How accurate do you think the estimates in A and B are? And you can see my answers there. Not very accurate. Now why? Why would you not believe these results? Real life. You read this study, Small. and you just kind of think all the time, don't that. Small sample. Small? 150,000 women? 60,000 men? Compared to how many people there are in the world, yeah. Remember what George Gallup said? Remember George Gallup said about the, about the suit? Remember, what he said? Remember how Gallup predicted the election within one percentage correct? He only used 50,000 people in his study. And the Literary Digest magazine used 10 million, right? He said if you stir the soup well, all you need is one spoonful <coughs> to know what the whole thing tastes like. So the number, you don't need to have a big number. That was what Gallup discovered and what Literary Digest magazine learned the hard way. Is you don't actually have to have a lot of numbers. As long as you stir the soup well, as long as what you have in your spoon is representative of the whole because you stirred it well before you took that spoon out. So there's something stirred badly here. It's not a matter of not enough people. They just didn't stir it well. well how, how so? Why should these results not be believable? Have you read that study? 75% of men are faithful. 80 Two percent of all people are faithful in their marriages. Is that true? Maybe they're not being faithful with their responsibility. Yeah, if, yeah, first off, yeah, good, good observation. I mean, they're being asked, right? They're not, they're not being monitored with secret cameras and the information brought forward, right? This is going through their minds and their responses, right? So if the person is cheating on their spouse, might there be a motive to not report that. Now, of course, they can make it anonymous or they can do whatever they want to do. But still, 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 if you're going to cheat on your spouse, you might not want to say that to anybody. Right? So first off, there's a problem on whether we're getting the truth. There's a problem on whether we're getting the truth. Right? It's not like who you're going to vote for. It's did you do this moral action? Yes or no? Not everybody likes to come forward with the truth in that including um, presidents of the United States and people like that, right? So, we've seen all that. So, um, that's a big problem. Secondly, I, I clicked the box, the sample was not representative of the target population also. Now, what does that mean? They're going to ask you about that. Do you know what that means? What's the target population? Remember what target means? Your goal. What are you aiming at? What is Dear Abby or whoever trying to figure out with these questions? Isn't she trying to figure out what percentage of, I guess, America is faithful in their marriages? Isn't that, I mean, it never says that anywhere, but we all understand. She's trying to give us, this magazine is trying to give us a feel for what percentage, let me say that part again, of America, or you know, some big group is faithful in their marriages, of America. Now, did she ask all, did she take a sample of people from America that was representative and in no way biased. You understand the bias? Like the football game thing was a bias, right? By asking only people going to the football game, they got biased results. People that like football. They didn't get a, if they, they instead they should have taken some kind of survey randomly at the school. And not just by the library where the smart people are always at the library or not. You, know, you can't do anything that's going to be not normal, right? Anything that biases the results. So what is going to bias these results? Well, these people are all readers of, of this magazine. She didn't ask anybody that doesn't read her magazine. Now, I don't know exactly what that means. I don't know if readers of her magazine are more faithful or less faithful. I don't know. But I know they're a certain kind of person. They're not your average person. Right? Not everybody reads her magazine. Just that itself biases results, you realize. It's kind of subtle. You have to take them. What Gallup realized is you have to take samples in a way that keeps it purely random. And does it make it football game attenders or magazine readers? Because every group has its tendencies, you know? Magazine readers, I don't know what they tend to do in the 
a marriage issue, but they have certain you know, personality types and tendencies. You're not going to get the true average results, in other words, because her sample did not represent the target. If her target was just her readers, if she said, I'm going to tell you about my readers, then great. Yeah, because you asked your readers, you tell us about your readers. But she really wants to make a conclusion about America in general, doesn't she? That's her target. So she should have asked readers and non-readers somehow. I don't know how. Surveyed on the street or whatever. But she needed to mix it in better. Does that make sense? You've got to make sure your target is representative, is represented well, and not biased by a smaller thing. All right. All right, we'll move on. So, okay, city planning department decides to conduct a survey to determine what percentage of the people in the city want to spend public funds to revitalize the town mall. Five interviewers are asked to pick a street corner of their choice within city limits and ask each passerby if he or she wishes to respond to a survey. Interviewers are asked to return to the same street corner until each has conducted 100 interviews. The results are shown on the table to the right. All right. So basically, people walk by in the street. They stand in a corner, people walk by and they go, hey, um, can I ask you a couple questions, right? And are, do you want to spend public money to revitalize the mall or do you not, right? So here's the results. Interviewer A here, 33 said yes, 67 said no, 323 did not respond, right? 323 said, I don't want to answer. And then on you go. And, and then E... E had a hard time. <laughs> I don't know what's up with E. He's not that approachable, maybe. I don't know. E ran, got frustrated and quit. See the note? E got frustrated and quit and did not get up to 100. Okay. What is the sample? 590 people told E, no thanks. But what is the sample size on this one? I got the answer 464. How did I get that? How am I getting that sample size? See what I added up? All of these. Add them up, right? So you don't need to do it right now. I mean, I did. And the answer is 464. Does that make sense? Because those are all the ones we have answers for. That's the sample size, 464. Does that make sense? What I'm doing there? If you want to save time on the sample, notice they're all 100, except for the bottom one. 100, 100, 100, 100, right? 80 and 20, that's 100. Those are all 100, and then the bottom one is 64, because that person got frustrated and quit. They're supposed to go to 100. Hey, Mr. Cole, snacks are fine as long as they're quiet in the future, please. Bananas are great. No, go ahead, go ahead. But Let's go, I got you. It just, just, so it doesn't disrupt, thanks. All right, so 464. Total sample size. So, um, coming on down here, calculate the response rate. Now, um, that's on your sheet. Let me let me tell you what that is. Good thing to put in your card. Response rate. Response rate is number. Uh, what is it? Number number of the response. That's what it is. Number that respond over total asked. So how do we how do we figure that out? How many actually gave an answer? What percentage gave an answer versus, you know, how many were asked? Well, a whole bunch of, there was a whole bunch of non-respondents, right, over here. Yeah, just add them all up. So add these up, and I don't know what you're going to get there. Oh, boy, I don't want to add. All right, I'll add them up. 323, 212, 105. 85. Somebody, if you got a total, let me know. 10, 4, 12, 21, 13, 15. So I got 13, 15 if I did that all right. But that's not everybody. That's the ones that said, I don't want to answer. That's not the total. You got to add that to the ones that did answer. Then you'll have a total. You with me? Are you seeing that? So it's going to be. Um, how many did answer? How many did give an answer? That's the 464, right? That's the sample. That's the ones that gave an answer. So whatever 464 is plus 1315, that's the total number of people that were asked. 464 gave an answer. 1315 didn't respond. 
And on the top is the number of respondents, 464. So that fraction must lead to be 26.1%. Does it work out? Somebody want to hit the buttons? Tell me if that's the truth. It's 464 divided by whatever that total is on the bottom. 1779. Is that right? Good. Questions on that? So that's called response rate. What does that mean? That means only 26% of the people that were asked actually gave an answer. Now look at the final question. This survey is subject to non-response bias. We talked about that yesterday. Do you remember that? I know I talked about a lot of things. I talked about World War II even yesterday. What's non-response bias? Remember that? That's, remember the, um, I did like when they do those polls on the radio or on the internet and they say, do you, who do you think should be Rookie of the Year? Or who do you... You know, think, what do you think about this decision with, um, you know, the FBI person that's been fired, you know? And people, like, will email their answer in or text their answer in. That's not a valid survey. In other words, you can't really believe those results because it's only the really extreme people that are highly interested in the topic that are going to actually respond. So you're going to get a bias. That's actually a bias that will throw you. It's not going to tell you the truth about what the general population thinks. Because all the medium people that care a little bit but, but, but don't care a lot aren't responding, right? They're not going to take the time to text in or email in. So whenever, whenever you're doing some kind of study and only a very small percentage of the people respond, then that's a biased result. You're not getting the truth. You're not going to get what really happens when the real election occurs if you do it that way because you're getting a biased result. You're just getting the extreme view is what you're getting. The people highly interested... In the, in the issue. Does that make sense? That one confuses people a lot. You guys good with that? When you have a very low response rate, right? you want it over 50%. I mean, there's no magic number. But when it's really low like that, that's most part of what happened to the Literary Digest magazine. They sent those things in the mail. Well, most people throw that stuff away. They didn't answer. right? A few answered. They were the extreme ones that were highly interested. So they got biased results. They got false. They didn't get truth. They got sweet little lies instead. Right? So that's the deal. You can't have low... So all those you hear on the internet, it's just baloney. That's just garbage. When they're on the radio and their internet, and they say, we, we, you know, what do you think about this issue? Call in. We had 80 callers and 60 of them, you know, think that whoever should be Rookie of the Year, well, that's, that doesn't mean that's what the general population thinks. That's just the extreme view is all that is. Okay, what are we talking about here? Study was conducted to determine how many undergrads at the university are familiar with a new financial aid program. There are too many students to conduct a census. The following sampling method... Wait, what would they just say there? Did you understand that? Too many students to conduct a census. Census. What does that mean? What's a census? Did you catch, did you catch that word yesterday? Thank you. That's everybody, right? Census is everybody. Like, there's too many students to do. So we're just going to ask a, a sample... A sampling method is used. Uh, da, da, da. Start with the alphabetical listing. Randomly pick a number from 1 to 100. Count that far down the list. Take that name and every 100th name after it. Sampling method, systematic sampling. Okay. So in other words, they take the list of all the students at the school. They pick a number from 1 to 100. They go, 93. And they grab the 93rd person on the alphabetical list. And then they just add 100. So they take the 93rd, 193rd, 293rd, 393rd. Just, just a way to get a bunch of random names. And then just asking the people, hey, what, do you like the financial aid thing or whatever it is? Yes or no? You know, they're just, just a way to get random names. That's their plan. Okay, let's, let's talk about their plan. Explain why the method used for the sample is not simple random sampling. Because it seems like random sampling, it, but technically, this is pretty picky, I think. It's technically not, um, it's not simple random sampling. Here's the reason, the B there. In simple random sampling, any two members of the population have as much chance of being selected as any other two. In this sample, two people with the same last name can never be in the same sample. Did that make any sense? Something is technically simple random sampling. Simple being a keyword. This is certainly random, but it's not simple random. 
if 82 people have the same likelihood of being in it, well, two names that are right next to each other or even have the same last name, they're never going to be in it because you're picking and then jumping 100. Right? Remember the method? Pick a name, jump 100, jump 100, jump 100, jump 100. Well, then you're never going to get two right next to each other. So it's technically not simple. Simple means you just take the whole group and you just randomly grab. So two next to each other could cut in, couldn't they? Or not. It could happen. But here, for sure, two next to each other will never come into the sample. So it's not simple random. It's another kind of random, but it's not simple. Does that make sense? B, 100% of the responding claimed that they were not familiar with the new financial... 100% said, we don't know nothing about it. Is this result more likely due to sampling variability or sampling bias? Sampling variability. The students sampled appeared to be representative cross-section of all the university undergrads. Yeah, there's no bias there, right? You know what I mean? There's no bias. There's no reason it would be bias. Now, there's nothing in the study that we have heard of, right? They didn't just ask the people that are at the financial aid office or something like that. That would be a dumb study. That would be bias, right? So, yeah, so, so we just say... It's, so there's, there's, two things, there's two things that can make a sample come out weird. Yeah, maybe I should say that clearly. Do you realize that? Variability and bias, right? When, when you just go out and randomly ask people who they're going to vote for or whatever, yeah, there's just randomness that happens. The variability, that's called. But then there's also bias. You can't control variability, but you can control bias, right? You can make sure you don't do a biased study. So this one's just variability. All right, let's see. I forget. So, uh, what's going to happen? For the last football game of the season, the coach chooses three captains by pulling the names of the players in a hat and drawing three. Oh, that's just, yeah, that's not weird. That's just simple random. Okay, nothing. There's a weird one coming, I think. Anyway, just random. Coach just throws all the names in a hat, draws three out. Random. All right, nothing important there. The lake. Okay. You want to estimate how many fish there are in a small pond. You ever thought about that? How do they know how many fish in a lake? How do they do that? Park rangers, biologists, they need to know this. At least approximately. You know. They got you know, park rangers that manage different lakes. Fisher, fishermen want to know how many fish. And they want to know how many different types. How many bass, how many trout, you know. Biologists need to know as they manage the fish populations. How do they do that? You ever stay up late at night thinking, how do they do that? <laughs> that would be weird. Um, I mean, do they like take their boats over the top of their sonar devices and try to count the little blips as they move around? That wouldn't be too funny. It's not technology that answers this question. They survey the fish. I mean, I mean, that's true, but not, they don't talk to the fish. What they do is they grab the fish, tag them, release them, grab them again like two days later after they've mixed around, find out the portion that have tags, they realize that portion is the portion of the whole lake, approximately, they have an estimate for the whole lake. Let me try that again. Doesn't make any sense at all. So what they do is they catch, tag, and release. So they don't, they'll just go out with a net, They'll just grab, say, like 50 fish. Let me, let me just give you, before we do the particulars of this problem, let me just make up. I want, I want to rate you on the make sense level. What if, you, what if you went out, right, with them and you caught 50 fish? You tag them, you, so you catch 50 fish, tag them, put a little tag on them, right? And then you release them to go back and swim around and do their fishy thing for a couple of days. You go back in a couple of days after they're all mixed around, here's the polling. It's like polling. It's like sampling. A couple days later, two days later, let's say, let's say you catch, two days later you catch, um, I don't know, uh, 40 fish at random. You just stick down the net and pull up 40. You look at them. And you notice that 20 have tags from two days ago. Right? 
So you understand, two days later, throw down your net, you pull up 40 at random, and then you put them on the deck, and you look at them, and you say, yeah, half of these fish are the fish we tagged a couple days ago, right? 20 out of 40. You getting that? That's just like going out on the street corner and saying, who are you going to vote for in four years? The Republican candidate or the Democrat candidate? And ask them and, and uh, come back and say, 50% of the people said they're going to vote for the Democrat candidate. What am I assuming by that? Maybe 50% of the whole population is, I don't know, if it was a good study, then that would be reasonable. Does that make sense? You're pulling the fish in a, set, in a sense. The second grab, the second catch, when you find out that 20 out of 40, right, because they all mixed around, right? And 20 out of 40 were the tagged ones. The little group you pulled up, 20 out of 40 were tagged. So you think to yourself, I just grabbed them randomly. Half of my little sample had tags. So probably half of this entire lake has tags. I just grabbed them randomly. So if that's true, if half of the entire lake has tags, that's what your poll, your sample is telling you, how many fish in the lake? You know how many have tags. You tagged them yourself two days ago. 50 have tags. And half the fish have tags. So how many fish in the lake? 100 fish, approximately. Do you see that? See how we can get an estimate that way? Just like polling. Do you see that? One more time, right? Half of the fish in your sample had tags. Right? Then the, your catch the second day. It's like asking the fish, are you a tagged fish or not a tagged fish? Right? You ask them by grabbing them. Right? Half of them have tags, so you're thinking, I just grabbed that round, and probably half the whole lake has tags. I know there's 50 that have tags. Probably there's about 100 fish in the lake. See how that works? And see how you can do that for, you can even just do bass or just trout, right? Just grab what you need, throw back the others, just count the trout, just count the bass. See how this is, this is exactly what they do. This is real life, this is modern. You can read Fish and Stream or whatever. Is that what it's called, Fish and Stream? Something like that. Field and Stream, that's it. Whatever those magazines are, you know. Yeah, this is exactly, you can read them. They, they caught and they dig. They, they, they do this for deer on the mountain, rabbits in the field. This is how they, this is how they count critters. So they catch them, tag them, release them, catch them again later, and do the percentage thing. All right, so you've got a feel. Let, let me give you the particulars now. That's like general feel, but let me give you the particulars. Here's how you exactly calculate an estimate for the number of fish. Basically, it's um, tag over total is tag over total. That percentage. This is the first catch. This is the second catch. Well, here, let, me, let me move it out of the way. Put it down here. First catch, second catch. First catch, second catch. Okay, so let's do it. Let's do this actual problem now. So here we go. Um, you, you first capture 500 fish tag them, put them back after a couple days. So 500 is the first catch, right? So that's the total fish in the first catch. Everybody seeing that? Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's the tagged ones, isn't it? That's the tagged fish. We tagged all those fish. That's tagged fish in the first catch. After a couple days, you go back. You capture 189, 27 have tags. So 27 tagged out of 189 in the second catch. You seeing what I'm doing there? Is that okay? So then you put an X down here. And that's going to be what? Total fish in the lake. It's on the bottom. So it's total. So I just solved that little equation, those two little equal fractions, for x. How do you solve that for x? Yeah, you've seen that before. You go diagonal, diagonal, cross multiply, zip and zip, right? So it'll be 500 times 189, 27 times x. Does that make sense what I did there? Just diagonal, diagonal. And then somebody have a calculator. What's 500 times 789? Wait, wait, 9, 4, 50. Well, maybe another zero. I'm kind of guessing. Is that right? Something like that. Yeah, two zeros, that's it, isn't it? Am 
Am I right? Right? Okay, and then divide by 27. Divide by 27, and I have no idea. What is it? 3,500. Just straight on? And that's our estimate. About, about 3,500 fish in the lake, based on that. So that's how they do it. That's how the, they count critters. Catch, tag, and release. Good. On that. Okay, I'll move on if you're okay with that. So tag over total equals tag over total, like polling. Okay. You have an extremely large coin jar full of nickels, diamonds, and quarters. You want to have an approximate idea, but you don't want to go through the trouble of counting all the coins. So you decide to use the capture recapture. Yeah, that's what it's actually. I call it catch, tag, and release. It's actually called capture recapture. Capture recapture method. For the first sample, you shake the jar well and randomly draw 150 coins. So you draw 150. So you just, you get this gigantic jar full of nickels, dimes, and quarters. So you just say, I'm going to try by sampling. So you just shake it, reach in randomly, grab out a bunch of, a sample of coins. Okay? And in your sample of 150 coins, you get 37 quarters, 45 nickels, 68 dimes. Using a black marker, you mark these 150 coins with a black dot and put them back in the jar. That's like tagging them, like tagging the fish. You're tagging the coins with a black dot, right? You shake the jar well, right? That's like letting the fishies randomly move around for two days. This is a fish problem, basically, right? You let them move around for two days. And then you pull out 100. This is your second catch, right? Your second catch, right? We have a first catch and a second catch. Catch 100, you get 35 quarters, 5 have the black dot. 28 nickels, 8 have the black dot. 37 dimes, 14 have the black dot. Estimate the number of quarters in the jar. So just ignore nickels and dimes, really. That was a lot of numbers and a lot of words. Let me help you hone in on it. It's not that hard. It's just going to be tag over total equals tag over total. This is the first catch. This is the second catch, right? It's a fish problem. Capture, recapture. We're tagging them and putting them back. Okay. Just for the quarters. I'm only doing the quarters. That's all they're asking me about is quarters. So ignore nickels and dimes. Okay, so let's take, let's take the numbers as they come. First time, the first sample, you shake the jar well, 150 coins, 37 quarters, and you marked them, right? You guys with me? Am I racing ahead? So the first time, 37, that's going to go right here. That's tagged fish, marked coins in the first catch. See how I know where to put that? Right? Because those are marked. All 37 of those will be tagged. They'll have a mark on them, right? The black dot. All 37 of those will be tagged. And then later, the second, that's all, that's all I need. I'm not going to do best with the 45, 68. I only need the 150. I'm just doing quarters, right? Let's go on. Second catch, you get 100. Who cares? 35 quarters Five have the dots. This is the second catch. Five tagged out of all, over 35. Right? Are you tracking with me? Let me put this back where it was. So this, so this was 37. This is five tagged out of, what was it? 35. There's our fraction. 37 over X is five over 35. Everybody see how I came up with that? Those are all numbers related to quarters, right? All related to quarters. Five tagged quarters out of 35 in the second catch, 37 tagged in the first catch. Find X, the total number of quarters. Does that make sense? Total number of quarters. We're trying to find the total number of quarters in the jar. So, cross-multiply. 
37 times 35 is 5 times x. Somebody have that number on their calculator? What's 37 times 35? 1295? Thank you. 1295 is 5x. Divide by 5, it must be that answer I have up there, 259. What is it? Yeah, 259. Yeah, 259, yeah. 259 quarters in there. Is that good? It's just a capture, recapture method. Catch, tag, and release with the quarters. Don't let the dimes and nickels throw you off. Moving on. Okay with that? Uh, determine lake sturgeon in a river, blah, blah, blah. Use capture, recapture. 160,000, 100 caught, tag release. Six were captured. So try it. Try the same thing again. So it's tag over total, right? Tag over total is equal to tag over total. This is the first first catch, second catch. So they're, they're giving you a little bit different numbers this time. They're changing the way they give you the numbers. That's making any sense? They don't give you the first tag, um, I, I think you might be right. What does it say? No. No, no. Okay, so, so, you know, instead of first and second, maybe it'd be helpful if I, if I gave you guys... Capture, recapture. That's another way. You know, first time, second time, or capture, recapture. So use that to help. Because right here it says 1,900 were caught. It says in the capture phase. See that? So that's in the first phase. Right? Because capture and then recapture. So 1,900 were caught, tagged, and released. So that's the top up here, right? Everybody with me on that? Right? That... That 1900 is right here. That's, does that make sense? What about the 160,000? Where's that go? Under the total? Yeah, that's, that's the total that were in the lake, huh? Right, that's what they concluded. That's the total in the lake. And then in the recapture, what does it say about the recapture? Of these tagged, Sturgeon, six were recaptured. So that's, that, that's tagged recaptured fish. Everybody see that? Because it says, of these tags. That means they're tagged. And then six were recaptured. So six recaptured tagged fish. So then the X is down here, isn't it? Everybody see that? Which is what they're asking me for, right? Based on this, give the number of sturgeon caught in the recapture. So what's the total caught in the recapture? That's what they want. Everybody okay with that? So 1,900 over 160,000 is 6 over X. Go diagonal, diagonal. 1,900X is 6 times 160,000. And just work out the math. I guess you get 505. That's the answer they gave me. Kind of getting scribbly there. So X ends up being 505. Questions I can answer on that one? They're just coming at you a little different on that one. Is that okay? All right, I'm going to flash off there if that's okay. Weird. 
and I'm not going to put it on the test. Um, let's see. One implicit assumption when using the capture capture method to test the size of population is that the capture process is truly random with all individuals having the same likelihood of being recaptured. Sometimes that is not true, and some individuals are more prone to capture than others. If that were the case, would capture recapture method be likely an underestimate? Be, be likely to underestimate or overestimate the size of population? Um, and the answer is underestimate. Yeah, that's there's one there's one valid critique of the uh, one valid criticism of the capture recapture method. What what some people say is they say, well, look, those fish you caught the first time, tag them or release them, you're going to just catch them again because those are the dumb fish or those are the surface fish or those are the whatever fish. They're just more easily caught. It's not truly random the second time. There's probably some truth to that. I don't know if there's a lot of truth to that. It makes a big difference, but there probably is some truth to that. And what does that tend to do to the sample? Well, if that's the case, to the degree that that is the case, I think that's certainly the case to some degree, it makes your, your thing an underestimate because the total population appears smaller than it really is. If the fraction of those tagged in the recapture appears to be higher than it is in reality, is that right? Yeah, right. Then the fraction of those tagged in the initial capture will also be computed, and the fraction of those tagged in the initial capture will also be computed as higher than the truth. The fraction of those tagged in the initial will also be higher than the true. That's true. Uh, but why is that under? Wouldn't that be over? I, see, I always get confused by this question. <laughs> I've, I've taught it like 10 times, and it confuses me every time. Um, why wouldn't that be under? I don't know. You don't care, right? Um, so what they're, what they're saying, okay, I've got to write it down, because I'm trying to think it in my head, and I can't do it. So it's tag over total is tag over total. And what they're saying, all right, so some of you are interested, I'm sure, so I'll, I'll, I'll work it out here. So what they're saying is that if the fish are, if there's some fish or rabbits or deer or whatever that are just more easily caught, and that's, then, then you're going to catch them more in the recapture, right? You're just going to catch them again, which means you're going to make this fraction too high, artificially high, higher than it is really randomly, right? You're going to get more, you're going to get the same fish in the recapture. You're going to catch again a lot of your already caught fish, right? In the recapture phase, you're going you're gonna to catch higher. So this fraction will be higher, right? You're trying, to, you're trying to say, how many of my, how many tagged fish did I get the second time out of total? You're going to get a lot of tagged fish because those are the easily caught fish to some degree, right? So this is going to be too high. This fraction's too high. It's artificially high because you just caught them again because they're catchable, which means since these two fractions are equal, equal, then this one's got to be too high as well, right? They're equal. So if one fraction's too high, the other one's too high. So what does it mean if this is artificially high, higher than truth, than it really is by pure randomness? Well, that means if a fraction is too high, there's two ways you can make a fraction high. You can make the top higher or the bottom lower. You with me on that? Am I talking to anybody other than myself? That making sense, right? You can make a fraction bigger. You ever stay up late at night thinking about how you can make a fraction bigger? There's two ways to make a fraction bigger. It's just what weird math teachers do, right? All right, so you can, if you have three-tenths, I can make this thing bigger by making the top bigger, four-tenths, or you can make the bottom smaller, right? Three-fourths is actually a bigger fraction than three-tenths, right? Three-quarters of the pie is more than three-tenths of the pie. So you can make the bottom smaller or the top bigger. Either way, you make the fraction bigger, bigger portion, right? So when I say this fraction is being made too high, that means the top's getting too big or the bottom's getting too small. Top's too big or the bottom's too small, right? Well, that means, oh, I see it, yeah. That means the total fish in the lake is too small. It's underestimate. Yeah, they're right. I always come to the fact that they're right in here, but it takes me a while to get there. That's tricky. I'm not going to put that on the test. That's, that's very careful, and it's tricky. It tricks me, too. 
So it, it means you're going to, so you should just know, you know, as you, you discerning, you're getting a college degree here, you want to be a discerning consumer of information. There is a problem. There is a small problem with the capture recapture method. Fish, deer, whatever, if they're more catchable, while you caught them the first time, while you catch them again the second time, that's going to tend to make this math underestimate. Because it's not truly random. Well, fish are just easily caught to some degrees. So that's going to underestimate. It's going to make this fraction too high, which makes this too high, which makes the bottom too low. So you're getting a, a total fish in the lake that's too low. It's lower than really is true. Underestimate of the total fish in the lake. Yeah. All right. That was tricky. Okay. Manufacturer of a new vitamin decides to sponsor a study to determine the vitamin's effectiveness in curing the common cold. 500? Oh, this is a good one. I like this one. Five, you, you watch. You tell me about this study. What do you think? 500 out of the 50,000. 50, they get this vitamin. They're going to see if it's good at curing the common cold. 500 out of the 50,000 college students in a large city were paid to participate as subjects in this study. All the participating subjects were suffering from a cold at the start of the study. The subjects were each given two tablets of vitamin X a day. Given two tablets of this thing a day. Based on the information provided by the subjects themselves, 457 out of the 500 were cured of their colds within three days. The average number of days a cold lasts is 4.87 days. So that was, you know, most of them were cured early. As a result of this study, the manufacturer launched an advertising campaign based on the claim that vitamin X is more than 90% effective in curing the common cold. Where are they getting the 90%? This over this, 457 over 500. If you divide that, it's 0.91 something, I think. Anybody got that? They have a calculator? What's 457 divided by 500? Oh, it's 914, I think. Is it 914? Yeah. So it's more than 90%, right? So that's why they're able to say that. All right, let's answer some questions. Question A, choose the correct answer below. What was, what was the question? Oh, was the study controlled? Oh, yeah, yeah. So we got to go into a whole new area now. That's right. That's right. To answer these questions, we're going to go, we're going to talk about clinical studies. All right. Let's do it. Um, so if we, let's go to a fresh page, talk about clinical studies. Okay. This is the part I think that's even more valuable. Let me, let me tell you guys some facts um, that are true. Um, if you take the world population, if you take the world, the entire world, and you take all the milk drinkers, milk drinkers, right here, and the never had milk even one time in their life, people. Over here, right? So I'm breaking all the world into two groups. Have you had milk once or more in your life? Or have you never, ever even had milk once, right? I'm not talking about being lactose intolerant. If you're lactose intolerant, you know it because you had milk once. You're still in the milk drinker category. You've had milk at least once, right? You're, you know, milk at least one time in your life. If you've had milk at least one time in your life versus if you've never ever had milk in your life. Did you know, this is true, that if you broke the whole world into that, those that die of cancer more, much more, die of cancer on this side and over here Almost no cancer. That's true. That is actually true. Now, how many people have never been in their life? I don't know what the numbers are. I think there's hundreds of thousands. <coughs> that's true. That's really true. Now, that's true. Now, what I want to show you, this, this, is, where, this, is, this is my favorite part of the course, because this is, I think, really valuable to show you how easy it is twist information. To take true information to present it in such a way 
that leads one to a false conclusion, right? So let me have, let me show you how to be a discerning absorber, consumer. I mean, we live in the information age, right? This is true. This is true. There's no lying here, but there's lying in what they want you to think. That's a true fact. You take the milk drinkers in the world, once they've had milk at least once, anyway, they, they die of cancer way more than those that have never had milk in their life. Way more. All kinds of cancer. So let's clear the shelves, right? Let's get the milk out of there. <laughs> Milk's causing cancer. It's not causing cancer. Well, what's going on? What's the, what, how could this be true and milk not be causing cancer? There's what's called a lurking variable. Have you ever heard of that word before? Lurking variable. Lurking variable. What, what does it mean to lurk? It means to hide out, right? You just hide out. A lurking, right? You hide away, right? So there's a lurking variable here. There's, a, there's something that's hiding, and it's really causing this to happen. It's making it look like milk is doing it. What is that? What's the lurking variable? Well, what you've got to realize is think for a second. I think, Cole, you were kind of on to something there when you asked about this group and how many are in this group. There's a lot in the group, but, but there's something <coughs> special about those people. Let's think for a second. Who do you know? Do any of your friends never had milk even once you, in their life? you know anybody that's never even tried it once? Not even once. I mean, it is a baby. Are you kidding me? No formula, no breastfeeding, obviously, no formula, no nothing, no milk ever, even once? Do you know anybody? No, I need it. Either, but there are hundreds of thousands of people. Where are they? They're not in America. Well, probably not many in America. Where are they? They're in some country, some far away place that is extremely malnutrition, right? That they've never had milk even once in their life. They're in one of these third world countries where. They not only do they not have they they never had milk once in their life. They also don't have enough to eat regularly. They don't have vegetables regularly. They don't have they don't have basic uh, medical care. What's it called? The uh, what's what's that basic vaccine that you know for malaria? That's right for malaria. You know like what is it? Every minute is that right? Yeah, every minute a child in the world dies from from a simple. They all they needed was a simple malaria shot. Every minute, right? That we all get when we have babies and go to the doctor, right? So anyway, so that kind of thing is happening. Right now in the world. So these people, they, they, yeah, they don't, they don't ever get cancer. Why not? Can't it. They don't live long enough. Is that what you mean? Yeah. They just die anyway. Yeah, they die at like two years old, three years old, five years old. They don't live long enough to get cancer. So that's the lurking variable. Age of death or general health or whatever you want to call it. General nutrition, right? That's what's that's what's going on here. The milk isn't causing cancer. The milk is causing you well, not not milk itself, but a general healthier diet, which usually involves milk at least once in your life, makes you live longer, and thus you have a better chance to get cancer. Right? You're given a chance to have cancer because you're given longer life. You see the deal there? Milk isn't causing, but you see how confusing it was at first. You see how they can take information. Just say it in a certain way, and you think, oh, so, so what's the moral of this story? Um, I forget the first word. What is it? Um, association is not causation. Just because milk is associated to this truth doesn't mean it's causing the truth, right? Just because something's involved in something doesn't mean it's the causing factor. That's what you want to be careful of, right? Just because something's involved doesn't mean it's the causation. So let me give you another one. If you took the states in the United States, let's just go local now, no, no weird third world country stuff to throw you out. United States, let's just take the United States, take our 50 states, okay? If you take the 50 states, let me, let me do this one. So if you take the 50 states of the United States, if you take the states with more Boy Scouts, Take the states with more Boy Scouts. This is true again. I'm giving you truth. 20 years later, in those states, in those 
states, compared to the states with less Boy Scouts, right? 20 years later, in those states, you know what you got? More, um, more convicts in jails, in prison. That's true. I'm not, I'm telling, just like the milk thing, the numbers would be, you know, you've heard, you've heard this saying, that numbers can lie. And, and that's, that's sort of true. I mean, numbers are just numbers, but if you just raw look at numbers and don't think carefully about what they mean, you can get a lie out of the numbers, right? If I just, if I could just, you know, I wish you had, I love it, I love having Google. I, I, I like the information. I think it's because I, I want the truth. I, I, I'm kind of into, when I speak, I try to be careful to not, and I'm sure I don't always be careful. I'm sure my wife and kids think I'm a little proud, but I'm always like, is that true? Is that true? Is that really true? I love that you just Google's right there all the time. I remember um, maybe we, like a year ago, we're driving somewhere, and the girls were like, my daughter's like, you know, um, what's that, man? One direction, right? That's right, right? I would say one way. I, it's, it's funny to you. I was like, okay, well, Lizzie goes, Dad, yeah, do you live another day? No, I don't. Whatever. One direction, right? I got it right now, right? I used to say one way all the time. One direction, okay. And Lizzie goes, that's, they're the, they're the most, they've sold the most records ever. And then maybe they have by now, this was a couple years ago. And I was like, no way. The Beatles have got to have done more than that. And, you know, and I just throw that out, you know, five minutes later, Lizzie's like, yep, yep, you're right, Dad. Actually, the Beatles have a few, I love Google. It's in right there. Boom. There's the, the truth. So if I can just hit Google with these numbers, these numbers are true. I'm not falsifying the numbers. If you take the states in the United States, more Boy Scouts, 20 years later, more convicts, in those states, in the prisons, you know, and it's not that weird where they're transferring states, or I don't mean anything dumb like that. They're not moving states or shipping the convicts around state lines. I don't mean anything like that. I mean people from those states that went where Boy Scouts in those states are now locked up in prison somewhere. You know, well, what's the deal? We got to close down the Boy Scouts. They're cranking out criminals. What's what's going on? What's the lurking variable? Boy Scouts are not causing criminals causing people to become criminals. See how easy this is to lie? Just throw out some numbers and they let you conclude what they want you to conclude. Think about what I'm doing here. So easy to lie with numbers. So easy. It takes no time to think these out. States. Look at, look at what those states. Let's, let's, let's think of a state. What's the biggest state? California. Do you think we have more Boy Scouts than other states? <coughs> Probably just because we have more people. Think we have more convicts in other states? Yeah. Probably just because we have more people. You get this, this population. They got more everything. They got more Boy Scouts. They got more Girl Scouts. They got more convicts. They also got more executives. They got more honest people. They got more everything. They got more people. That's all that is. States, bigger states, have more everything. That doesn't mean Boy Scouts are becoming criminals. They just got more everything. So they got more Boy Scouts, they got more criminals, they got more honest people, they got more everything. But if, but if you don't realize that at first, it looks like Boy Scouts are causing something. You see how the numbers work? So this is again the moral of the story. Association is not necessarily causation. It may be. So with all that said in mind, how do we determine truth then? Because we need to. We, do, we need to do studies and we need to get to truth but it's very easy to get wrong information and wrong conclusions. So we have what's called clinical studies. Let's get down. You have the handout still. There's a bunch of, so you don't need to write all these down. They're on your, you want to save time. I'll just write down facts that are helpful, but the basic definitions are on your sheet. Where do they start? Um, clinical studies on the back. Is that where it is? Thank you. Clinical study. There it is. Clinical study is on the back. What's a clinical study? Uh, trying to determine if a single variable or treatment can cause a certain effect. So that's like, does milk really cause cancer? Do Boy Scouts really crank out criminals? Right? Trying to figure out how do you know when something really does cause something? If it's very easy to get it wrong, how do you make sure? Because th certain things do cause certain things, right? Smoking causes cancer. That has been proven very clearly, right? And lots of data. It's clear as, as a bell, right? So um, how do they prove that? How do they know that? How do they know it's not just some weird association thing? Well, you've got to do some things to make sure you're careful. So first off, you've got to watch out for confounding variables. That's, that's what I was, the lurking variable. I called it a lurking variable. They called it a confounding variable. Another hidden cause, right, like population or whatever. Controlled study. Okay, they do a controlled study. See the words there? 
controlled study. When the subjects are divided into two groups, treatment and control. So let me write that out. A controlled study. So what you do in a controlled study is you have two groups. One group gets the stuff, whatever it is, the drug, the treatment, the whatever. One group gets the treatment. The second group, or the first group gets to the second group, gets nothing. They're called the control group because they help you control the experiment and get to the truth. That makes sense. You're trying to test out a new drug, new vitamin or whatever. Then you don't just give it to a bunch of people like the study we just read. We'll get back to that. You take two groups and you give it to 50 and you don't give it to the other 50. And then you ask them after a while if they're getting better. And you look for a difference, right? You don't just have one group that gets it and nothing else. You have a group that gets it and a group that doesn't get it. That brings control. That way you know any differences. The only difference between those groups is some got the drug, some didn't. So whatever difference is being done by the drug. Does that make sense? That's how you learn that. Treatment group, control group, I just wrote those out. Placebo effect. You guys know all about that, right? Placebo effect. It's written on there. The idea that one is getting the treatment can produce positive results, right? I mean, there's been a lot of research in the last 50 years about how, just how mental we are, right? When we think something good is being given to us. Our mind often has a healing effect on our body. So that's not really the drug, is the point. And so you need to, you need to take care of that. If you're trying to determine if a, if a drug or a surgery or something really does improve health, then you've got to get the mental aspect out of there somehow, which means you do what? You make the other people think they got the drug. So you weed out the mental part, right? You tell all hundred, you tell both groups, oh yeah, you're getting a real drug, but really you just get a sugar pill a placebo, a false drug, just a sugar pill, innocent, right, to the one group, and then you give the real drug to the other group, and that way if there's a difference in results, you know it's not just mental, because they all thought they were getting the drug, but the one group actually got healthier, so then the drugs really do. See the idea? That's called placebo. Blind study. Blind study is important because um, often the doctors recording the results will, um, oh, wait, 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 I'm getting that messed up. Blind study is when the subjects don't know. Yeah, so that's why I just asked, you tell them they're getting the real drug, but they're not, right? You fake them out, so that they're the mental. Now, the double blind is even sometimes we can't tell the doctors, can't tell the doctors which patients got the treatment, which patients didn't, because they will tend to write more favorable, I mean, a lot of diagnoses are, are not exact. All right, so um, let's, let's put all this together. Do you guys know, um, let, me, let me read these results. Do you guys know in the 1950s, so this is after World War II. I promise I won't talk about World War II anymore. This is after World War II, 1954. Do you remember the big thing? I wouldn't if I hadn't just taught this class all the time. Um, what page is this on? Page 512. They, they cured polio. At that time, the cure for polio was done. But um, it was a big deal to, to make sure whether it was going to really, really going to work. So 1954, what, what happened? Let me give you the, the results of this. In 1954, this is where this comes in real important. Over a half a million cases of polio. There were, there were over a half a million cases of polio between 1930 and 1950. And now it's pretty much gone. It's been eradicated in the Western world at least. Um, usually children, it was usually children, and it resulted, it resulted in being paralyzed or death. From the pulley. It was serious. It was a big deal in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. All right, so by 1953, by 1953, there were several possible vaccines. They weren't sure which ones were going to work best. They had a bunch of them developed by 1953, but they had to check them, right? They don't want to like give them out to all the American <clears throat> children 
and, and you go, whoops, you know, that would, that would have been very, very bad. So they had to have a big trial to make sure it's really working. So how'd they do it? How do they find out if a certain vaccine is really going to work and not just be, you know, placebo, be in their mind, or, you know, be make-believe, is it really going to work? So basically, here's what they did. Um, the, the final decision on how best to test the effect was in Salk. He was famous. He's on Time Magazine. He's the guy that came up with it. His, it was that doctor, his, his vaccine. The Salk vaccine um, was left to an advisory committee of doctors, public officials, and statisticians convened by the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis and Public Health Service. So this big group decided how to go about the study. It was a highly controversial decision, but in the end, it was a large-scale, randomized, double-blind, controlled placebo study was chosen. You understand all those terms now, right? 750,000 kiddos were randomly selected to participate in the study. Of these, about 340,000 changed their mind and said, no thanks. So 750,000 children um, randomly selected. So first off, it had to be random, right? You can't just get all the rich kids or the poor kids or the kids that live in the East Coast or the West Coast, then you're not going to get a random truth, right? Randomly grabbed 350,000 kids. 340 right away backed out when they heard the deal. Here was the deal. Half of you will be given a fake sugar pill. Half of you will be given the real deal, right? Because they got to discern if the vaccine is really doing it or if it's just all in their brain. So half the kids are told right away, you might get nothing. You might get no treatment at all. And, and, and you won't know. You've got to be blind in this. You've got to be not told whether you're getting the real deal or not. And even the doctors were not allowed to know because doctors, because when you, when you identify like a year later if the child has polio or not, you, you, it's, it's, it's a sketchy at first. I mean, over time, it's very clear. It becomes very clear. But like within the first year, it's hard to tell. The doctor looks at little symptoms and tries to decide. Well, if they knew, oh, this person really was given the vaccine, or this person really wasn't, they might tend to bias the results. So the doctors were, didn't know which ones had been given the real deal either. Only administrators over the whole thing knew which kids got the real deal and which kids did not get the real deal. So when all was said and done, here is the results. Um, number of cases of polio they had in the treatment group, in the treatment group, there were 200,745 kiddos. In the control group, there were 201,229 kiddos. And here's the number that had polio. 82 in this group, 162 in that group. See, it's double. And paralyzed. Paralyzed. Uh, 33. 115, that's almost, what, four times as many? And death, some of the kiddos died. Four in the control group, nobody in the treatment group died. That convinced them strongly that the salt vaccine was working. See those numbers, right? The control group, they didn't, they didn't know, they just got a sugar pill. No vaccine. Right, you tracking with me? The control group did not get the vaccine. They were for control. Does that make sense? I remember last time I taught this class, everybody getting confused on the test about what the control group was. Let me be clear on that. The control group gets nothing because you're trying to control the experiment, right? To compare, to have something to compare to. So the control group gets nothing. So this was real life. The control kiddos got, those 201,000 kids got nothing. Four of them died because they ended up being in the group that didn't get the real deal. 115 become paralyzed. Whereas the group that got the treatment, a lot better. Not perfect, but a lot better. None of them died. There are only 33 paralyzed, one-fourth as many, half as many even had the polio. So that, that convinced them it worked, and then they passed it out to everybody, and we've eradicated polio in the Western world. Almost in the East as well. I heard the other day someone in the small countries in the East has just, just got rid of it too. Anyway, all right, so... With that said and done, let's go back to the questions. Now, with all that information about how you really do a clinical study, what do you think about this vitamin study? Let's, let's, let's be a little critical on it. Was this a controlled study? First question, question A, was this a controlled study? 
What's a, what's a controlled study mean? Got to have a control group. Got to have two groups. One of them you give nothing to, the other one you give the drug to, right? That's how you control, right? Because you compare them. Otherwise, who knows? If it's doing it, maybe, maybe it was just, you know, the drug started to go away in those people for some other reason, other, I mean, the, the, the disease, other than the drug. So our answer is no, there was no control group, right? They, they just gave the vitamin to a bunch of people. They didn't also have another group that didn't get the vitamin. All right, question B, list three possible causes that confound the study. Three reasons it's a bad study. All right, I'm giving it to you there. Do you guys see the reasons there? Did that occur to you? Did you notice that the volunteers were paid? <laughs> That's a problem, right? Hey, you want to do this study? We're this company. We'll pay you 50 bucks to take our drug and tell us how good it is in three days, right? Well, yeah, are you going to get the truth that way? Sometimes, but you'll get some biased results as well, right? That's not a good way to do a study. Not if you, not if you want the truth. In fact, there's a lot of companies don't want the truth, do they? <laughs> not if you want the truth. How about next? College students, right? Who'd they, who'd they sample? College kids. Just college kids. That's not generally representative of the population. There's old people, young people, just college kids. And college kids are a certain kind of certain kind of person, right? Not generally representative. And lastly, the people themselves said whether their cold was better or not, right? That's, that's biased, right? That's them self-reporting. Much, it's just not a wise, so this study, there's not good reasons to believe the results of a study like that. Do you see all that? Does that make sense? We good? So those kind of questions beyond the test, things like that. Ankle surgery, cure arthritis. 324 individuals who met the inclusion criteria, 665 declined to participate. Researchers randomly divided three groups. Okay. Look at these groups, guys. This one's interesting. Type A, so th three groups. Type A, ankle surgery. The second group, type B, a different kind of A. They're trying to see what kind of surgery is most helpful. Type A or type B, right? They're going to break them into groups. Type B. The third group, look at this. The third group received a skin incision. They cut them open to make it look like they had had ankle surgery. But no actual surgery was performed. And you don't know which group you're going to be in. What do you think about that? It's catch you open for nothing. Just for their data. Okay? The patients in the study did not know which group they were in. And they did not know if they received a real surgery or a simulated surgery. In the two-year follow-up, all through three groups said they had slightly less pain <laughs> and better ankle movement. But the fake surgery group often reported the best results. Now, this particular problem is made up, but it's made up on something that really happened, and probably more than once. Where is it? I don't know if I have time to find it. Read it all to you. I, well, I don't have time for that. But it did. It was in Houston. I remember I read, I read it earlier. There was a study just like this. They did. It was actually knee surgery. They did it at a veterans hospital in Houston, Texas. So they, they, did, they had a bunch of veterans. They did this knee surgery on them. But they had two groups. And one group they did the fake surgery on. They just cut their knee open and didn't do any surgery at all and sealed it back up. And it was just like this. Two years later, they asked them all how their knees are doing. The fake surgery group reported the best results. So what does that mean? That means the surgery is doing nothing physically. It's all in your mind. And that's all debated these days, right? There's certain surgeries really, you know, people talk about, I'm, I'm getting old, I'm 50, so I got a lot of friends that, you know, they're, they're thinking about having a back. They, thankfully, I'm so far so good, no back problems or knee. But, you know, they're thinking about having the back surgery or the knee or the this or that. And, and, and there's debate. There is. You're like, yes, my, my friend did that and it never got better. My other friend did it and he was great afterwards. And, you know, and, and, and up for debate, you know? So it's certainly in that one in the veterans hospital, they should conclude that that knee surgery is doing nothing. It's all in their mind. It's all in their mind, right? Now, not that all surgeries, some surgeries are very helpful. My wife had knee surgery, and it was very helpful. So anyway, I don't think it was just all in her mind. <laughs> so, uh, all right. So uh, let's take a look. So what would that mean? Choose the correct answer. What's, what's the question? Oh, describe as specifically as you can the target. 
What's the target population of this study? What are they aiming at? Remember, target is what you're aiming at. What are they aiming at? Do you see it's all potential ankle surgery patients? Do you all see that? This, this, this is answered wrong a lot by students. Is that, is that okay? Does that make sense? Target is what you're aiming at. You're not just aiming at the 324, the 159. Why are they doing this? They want to know if, in general, the ankle surgery works or not, right? All of them. Here we go. Da -da -da. Neck surgery, arthritis, da da da, same kind of thing. Divide three groups. One received neck surgery A, B, and the third, the fake. Patients in the study, da da da. Okay, let's add. So, same kind of thing. There's three groups. There's A, A surgery, B surgery, and then fake. Fake surgery. So there's two different kinds of surgery and then fake surgery. Let's go through it. Was this study controlled placebo? Well, you see my answer. Yes. And the green, the, the red's the wrong answers. The, the green is the real answer. So I guessed wrong. I'm just going quick on my computer. But it told the right answer in the end. Yes. Why is it, why is it controlled placebo? Are we clear on those terms? There's a control group. Who, <clears throat> who's the control group? The group receiving the fake, the sham surgery, the fake surgery. That's the placebo. Placebo means fake, right? Fake. So that's a controlled experiment. They do that so they know it's not just mental, right? B, describe the treatment group. So those who received treatment. That would be the first surgery group who got type A and the second who got type B. They got treatment of some kind. They got something real, not just fake. A and B. C, could this study be considered randomized controlled? Yes, the 150 patients in the study were assigned to treatment groups at random, right? They just took the 150 and broke them into groups at random. So it's a randomized controlled experiment. So you're going to get truth out of that. That's why they do that. Because they want to know, which is good, right? I mean, it's a bummer if you're one of the ones who got the, the no surgery. But still, it's good if for the rest of everybody else afterwards they know whether this surgery is really doing something or not. So they don't cut, up, cut open a thousand more people for nothing. Right? We've got to get it truth at some point. Right? Good there? Oops. Question study. All right, so following expert uh, excerpt refers to this by this person, Fibiger, Dr. Fibiger, who went to receive Nobel Prize, da da da. Purpose of the study was to determine effectiveness of a new serum for treating diphtheria, common and often deadly respiratory disease in those days. Uh, Fibiger conducted the study over a one year period in one particular Copenhagen hospital. New diphtheria patients in mid hospital received different treatments based on the day of admission. In one set of days, call them even days, the patients were treated with the serum daily and also received the standard treatment. Patients admitted on alternate days, the odd days received just the standard. Over the one-year period of the study, eight uh, out of the 229 patients admitted on the even days treated with serum died, whereas 30 of the other ones died. So the serum was helping. Only eight died instead of 30. Um, describe the sample for Fibature's study. The sample is the 484, right? It's the 484 people. Where are they getting that 484 number? Oh, it's the 239, right? Plus the 245 is the 484 people that got it. Okay, let's go on. Is selection bias a possible problem? It is unlikely since humans were not involved in the selection of the patients. Yeah, um... Yeah, there's no, right, they just randomly, it was just the day they came into the office, assigned them to the group, right? If you came in on an even day, you went to one group, getting the serum, came in an odd day, you went to the other group, not getting the serum. So that takes bias out of it. See how you have to have a way so it's not biased. If you just tell a doctor, doctor, you go out and pick which ones get the serum and which ones don't. Well, he's a human being or she's a human being. And he or she is going to pick people they like better or least to get the serum or not. They're going to bias the study. Right? It's not going to be truly random anymore. It's not going to, and you're not going to get at the truth. So you've got to take human bias out if you want to get at the truth. All right. Made up university. <coughs> okay. 
50 students, 30 female, 20 male, in the Math 101 class, Tasmania State University. Professor chooses a sample of 10 students from the class as follows. Five are randomly chosen from the females, five from the males. Does every student in the class have an equally equal likelihood of being selected for the sample? No. There's a higher chance of selecting a male student than a female. Yeah. Did you see that? How does that work? Well, if you're, a, if you're, in, you're in this class, right? I suppose you're, you're in this class. There's 30 females, there's 20 males. If you're a female in this class, what's the chance you'll be selected? How many females did he pick? Out, out of the 30, he picked five females and five males, right? So if you're a female, the female, the chance that you're going to be selected is 5 out of 30. If you're a male, the chance that you're going to be selected is 5 out of 20 because there's less males in the class and he's still picking the same amount, 5. So this is higher. This is what, 0.25? And this is, I don't know, what's, what's 5 out of 30? 1 sixth, whatever that is. What's 1 sixth on the calculator? 0.16? Ah, I remember it. 0.16666, anyway. Yeah, eventually around seven. So 16, 17, yeah, 17 technically, huh? So it's lower percentage, right? The chance, so that, that means it's not equally likely, right? Every student doesn't have the same chance. The males have a better chance of being picked because there's less, All right? But so that means, so that it's the randomness is kind of off a little bit. Does every set of 10 students in the class have an equally likely to be selected? No, for example, the group of 10 females has no chance of being selected, right? You understand? Not... You can't, he's not going to choose all, all, any group of 10 females. He's going to choose five males, five females. So this isn't truly random, is the point. The point in those questions is, this is not truly random. This is kind of random, but it's not truly random. Truly random would just be throw all 50 hats in the, hats, names in a hat, pick out 10. Not break them into men and women and pick from there. That wrecks the randomness. Everybody see that? To be purely random is to have them all in one hat. All right, here we go. In a study of three, 39, 37 seniors at college, it is found that 50% own a vehicle. That's a population parameter. Why? Because the value is a numerical measurement describing a characteristic of a population. Did that make any sense? That wasn't a sample, in other words, right? They didn't just say, hey, let's just grab 50 seniors at this college and ask them if they own a vehicle. Oh, we found 50% on a vehicle. Right? That would be a statistic if you just grab a small group. But this is the whole, all the seniors, as far as I can tell. Right? This was all the seniors. They, asked, they, they took every senior in college. 50% owned a vehicle. So that's, that's the whole population, which makes it a parameter. PP, population goes with parameter. Statistic with sample. All right. Let's try this one. One pollster waited outside her local town hall and asked people walking by which party they had voted for. She was surprised to see the Democrat win when her results showed a landslide Republican win. Choose the correct answer below. What? That's a selection bias. Why? Why is that selection bias? Why is there a bias there? Did you guys ever hear about the uh, when George Bush was elected, George W. Bush, the first time? Was that 12 years ago, 16 years ago, something like that? Anyway, did you hear about they did exit polls and they were pretty far off? Like when people were coming out of polls, that was pretty close to him and Gore. Remember that year? Bush and Gore, pretty close. That was the hanging chads in Florida, whether it was blue or red, that whole really close year, right? When people were coming out of the polls, they were they always do this. They were asking, who'd you vote for, who'd you vote for? That year it was particularly off, though. People that voted for, which way was it? I think, uh, I can have it wrong, I don't remember. But uh, it went one way badly. I think, um, I think people who voted for Bush were less likely to say so. 
were less likely to engage the pollsters, and they would just kind of walk away for whatever reason. I don't know why. People who would voted for Gore were more anxious or willing to talk to the pollsters. So, coming out, so, they were, so the African people were coming out, they were recording, who'd you vote for, who'd you vote for, you know, and writing it down and then trying to give the information before it was determined. And from that information, they were strongly predicting Gore was going to win. But the truth is, a lot of people, in fact, more people had voted for Bush, I guess barely, or I don't remember what the final numbers were, but anyway, enough, um, and um, they just weren't saying it. So, so it's not, so again, this biases it. When you engage somebody and talk to them face to face, that's a bias about who's, who's going to be willing to talk to you or not. That tends to be a certain kind of personality that's willing to talk or not willing to talk. So that's a selection bias. That produces a bias. It's hard not to. You can tell this is kind of tricky. It's hard not to get a bias on the real. Okay, so um, do you oppose the present state flag that contains Confederate symbol, a symbol of the past slavery in the South, and a flag supported by extremist groups? <laughs> yeah, so uh, that's a, um, that person asking that question is causing a false answer to happen. Make sure if you talk to, you know, if I can hear you a little bit up here so those people aren't distracted that are around you. Thank you. So, um, yeah, do you see that that's called, what's it called? Leading question bias, right? So if you really want the truth, you can't lead the person with your question, right? You, you see how that's going there? Right, when they, when they say it all negatively, do you, should, should the Confederate symbol be allowed? A symbol of past slavery in the South and a flag supported by extremist groups. You're going, well, no, no. You know, whereas if they just ask it straight, you might get the truth, right? About what they really think anyway, right? So that's leading question bias. What's a better way to ask the question, do you favor or oppose the state flag and the Confederate symbol? Just straight, you know, and then you'll get what they really think. You won't be twisting their arm. And, I mean, if you want the truth, if, if they're going to be a vote or something and you want to know how it's going to go, then you do it in a way that's neutral. All right. That's pretty obvious, right? Is that good on that? So having the, this, this chapter, always as a teacher, I want to be helpful with this chapter. And so I always go through all the homework. I do those handouts. And I feel good about it. And, and usually the students all seem to feel good. And then I take the test. And this is the worst test. Not terribly so. It's not like dramatic. But it's a little lower. And I always think, oh, they've got it. They've got it. They're going to get every question right. You know, and then I give the test. And I grade it. And there's all this, the, the Scantron machine's making all this noise. Da -da 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 Marking them wrong. Like, what? And I'll look back, and I'll go over it with them, and I'll go, da 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 And everybody will go, oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah, that's right. So, so I always think, how can I help with this chapter better? What can I do to make, because I, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to take it all in, but, but it's a little tricky when it comes to the question. So, having said all that, that's why I'm doing the practice. One of the main reasons I'm doing the practice exam thing when are we doing that? Is that? Well, that's not till we got to get. That's right. We got to get fourteen. We're not ready for the practice, and we got to get to chapter fourteen, don't we? Which is tomorrow. So we're gonna take the practice exam on Monday, and then we're gonna take the real exam on Tuesday. But yeah, that practice exam day is gonna be important. Yeah, people get fooled by this stuff for whatever reason. Those little words are tricky, and different options kind of look right almost. So why don't I do this? I know um, we got twenty minutes left. Um, I'm sure you'd like to go, but we, we, it would be better. So that, that was all chapter 13. That was it. But it, like I said, it's tricky. All right, here we go. So chapter 14 is descriptive. So, so what chapter 13 was all about is how do you wisely gather information, right? That's what 13 was all about. What is the wise way to gather information? Now, 14. Okay, now that you've got this information, what do you do with it? Here's a table of some Kim 103 tests containing 10 questions, 10 points each. Make a frequency table for the Kim scores. All right. How do you, how do you communicate a bunch of numbers to a bunch of people in a way that's meaningful? That's what this chapter is about, right? So chapter 13 was how do you gather data. Chapter 14 is how do you give out data in a way that's helpful. So... Looking at this, if I was just to read these numbers, that wouldn't be helpful, right? If, if this was your guys' test scores, 
And you guys said, hey, how'd the class do as a whole? And I said, oh, you want to know how the class did as a whole? Here we go, 190, 80, 60, 60, 80, 70, 70, 60, 100, 100, 90, 10, 20, 50, 50, 50, 70, 70, 70, 90, 90, 70, 90. Well, what's that? That does nothing for you. That's not the way humans work. We don't think, we can't take all those numbers in and organize them in our head. So what do we do? We have all kinds of different ways, which is what this chapter is about. Pie charts, bar graphs, and other things like that to display information in a way that's meaningful and helpful. It's really pretty easy chapter. Let's just go through. We're going to make first off a frequency table. That just means, let's go through. How many hundreds? One, two, three, three hundreds. So I'll put three hundreds. How many in the 90s? One, two, three, four, five. Five in the 90s. How many 80s? One, two, no, that's a 60, huh? Two, two, two in these. How many in the 70s? One, two, three, four, five, six in the 70s. How many in the 60s? One, two, three, in the 60s. All right, how many in the 50s? <clears throat> One, two, three. How many in the 40s? None. 30s, none. 20s, one. 10s, one. And that's it. And none in the zeros. There we go. So that's one better way to display information. Does everybody see that? If I gave you this information, you would know better how the class did as a whole. That's one, that's one way. We're just going to look at several ways to display a bunch of information all at once. Good so far? Just count them up, move them on. All right. Okay, so here they're giving me some more test scores. They want me to turn into frequency. I won't go through that again. That's obvious, right? <clears throat> I just took these numbers, put them into a frequency chart. Now, how do you turn a frequency chart into um, a graph, like one of these bar graphs? Let me do that for you really simply. So notice how they all have frequency up the left side. Over here is frequency. Frequency. Down here is the grades. So we have the what? What's the first zone? I can't tell what that even says. I'm all messed up on this. What is this? There we go. All right. So um, looking at it. So it looks like. Is this the F's? Hmm, I cannot tell. Let me help. Okay, so what they want me to do is make a frequency chart, and they want me to put the A's, the B's, the C's, the D's, and the F's as bars, right? You just make the bars come up. So like A is going to come up to 8. So just have it come up to 8, right? Just 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So A comes up to 8. B, how many B's? Seven. How many C's? Four. How many D's? One. And how many F's? Four. Like that. So that's easy enough, right? The bars just come up to the frequency. Like how many got those various scores? Good on that? Easy? How many degrees in a circle? 360. 360. That's about all the geometry you need to know in here. 360 degrees in a circle. Yeah, so they give me this information like two people got A's, nine got B's, ten got C's, three got D's, two got F's. And they want me to make a pie chart out of the grades. So then what I'm going to need to do is just figure out the percentage. What's, what's the total number of people there? 11, 21 to 4, I think it's 26. We add those up. Yeah, 26. So then how do you figure out the percentage of A's, for example? Yeah, just take 2 divided by 26. Somebody have that in their calculator? 7.69, I bet. 0.0769, because I'm looking at these other answers. They're all 7.69 for the A. So that's for the A. 
Now let's do B. What's the B total? 9 out of 26. Let me have that. Is 11.54? I'm looking at the answers. I'm cheating. So, what is it? Oh, it's the other one. Okay. So 0.3462. So can I already tell which answer it is? D. It's D, huh? It's this one over here. Everybody see that? They're the only two that have A and B right. Done. I, I, I thought I was going to have to do the angle degree thing. I didn't have to do that. Just figure out percentages. You can tell which pie chart it is. Not good? They're just putting the information into pie charts. That's all they're doing. This is the easier part of the next exam is this step. All those words is what tricks, tricks people. So. All right. So here we go, A through C. How many students took the math quiz? So could you guys do that? Can you go from a frequency chart to answering these questions? How do I know it's 40 students that took the math quiz? Just count them all. Just count them all. Yeah. So this is just four. Everybody see what the numbers are that we would count up? Yeah, this, would, this one would be four. This one's also four. This one's what, two? This one's at um, 13. These guys are both at... It's a five? I can't tell. Five, yeah. These guys are both at five. And this one is at... Two or three. Three? Three. Yeah, just add those up. Four plus four plus two plus 13 plus five plus five plus three. I get 36. I'm only getting 36. Am I missing something? Oh, I missed this number right here. This four. An extra four. There we go. 40. Yeah, that was the answer. 40. All right, next question. What percentage of the students scored two points? Zero. Yeah, nobody scored two points. The lowest score is three points. Right? Scores are on the bottom. Just making sure you can read the graph. Scores are on the bottom. Frequency means how many got that score, right? Frequency means how many. So, right, maybe I should slow down and see what this is, right? Four people got a score of three on that quiz. Four people got a score of four. Right? Thirteen people got a score of seven. And on you go. Right? Isn't that good? All right. So, so this one's zero percent. <coughs> and last one over here. If a grade of six or more is needed to pass, what percentage passed? So if you need six or more to pass, who passed? Six or more. That would be... These four, these 13, 5, 5, and 3. Those guys, right? 4, 13, 5, 5, and 3. What is that? 30, yeah, 30 out of 40 students, right? So 75%, yeah, 3 fourths, 75%. Good on that? That easy enough? Just reading the bar chart? Bar graph? Okay. Okay, so cause of death, possible cause of death in population among 18 to 20. What, what makes 18 to 22 year olds die? Usually, what does it say up there? Accidents. Accidents, right? It's not usually a heart attack or something, right? <laughs> Although there's 3.7% that have that. But um, yeah, all right. So. Then cause of now is is cause of death quantitative or qualitative? You ever heard of those words before? Yeah, Qu a, a quantity a quantity is a number, right? Quantity means how many, right? So quantitative means is it, is it a number or not a number? So what if they said, hey, somebody died? What was their cause of death? It was three. No, that's ridiculous, right? Cause of death is not a number. Fell off a ladder or something, right? You know, it's not. It's, so it's not. It's qualitative, right? Everybody with me? It's not. It's not a number. That makes sense. Based on the data provided in the pie chart, estimate the number of 18, 20 year olds who died in the population study due to accident. <coughs> so now they want the number. How they come up with that? Or the computer? How they come up with that number who died of accidents? 
Both by what? Uh, the percentage times the number of people. And what's the number of people? Yeah, that 90,000 over. Exactly. Is everybody seeing that? It's exactly right. Right? So to, to do this one, you've got to take that 19,500. All they said was N, but Cole's right. So everybody catching that? That means the total number of people in the study. Whenever they give you N, pretty much in this chapter, whenever they give you an N, that's the total number of people in the study they're, they're looking at. So 19,000 whatever people total times the accident percentage. The, but you've got to make it a decimal, right? 0.45. I've got to do this. Accident percentage here, 0.45588. I got that right? Yeah. And hit that, and I guess that's 8912 rounded to the nearest whole number. Does that make sense for everybody? Last one, estimate the size of the central angle for other. Now, how do you, how do you find an angle? Remember, there's 360 degrees total, right? So just take that portion, that decimal, times 360. So what's the other category? Others, that one. So change the color here. So bring that down. So the other is, whoops, I grabbed the wrong thing. What am I doing up there? Not here. Here. This one. So it's 0 0.21513. That's the other. Times uh, 360 degrees. Now, why am I multiplying by degrees? Because now, now they want an angle. They don't want total people. You with me? In question B, they said how many people, so I multiply by the total number of people, the percentage times the people, or the decimal times the people. Now I'm, at, now I'm multiplying the decimal for other times the degrees in a full circle. 360, you do that, you get 77 degrees, says the computer. Good on those. Do that. All right. So, we got a pie chart, spending by the government on things. Estimate how much money the federal government spent on defense. So how do we do the defense? You just take the defense percentage. Question? And the question says one trillion equals one thousand billion. Yeah. You ever thought about that? How a thousand in any category kicks you into the next category. So, um, so, okay, so how much is, uh, how much is, how much is a million? Well, I mean, how much is a million? A million is a million. I mean, I mean, how many zeros? So there's a million, right? Six zeros, right. So that's a million. If you take, if you have a million dollars, let's say a hundred times, what, what does that do? Well, that's, that's a hundred million, right? You would just, you'd just add the two zeros, right? That, that's one hundred million, right? No, so it just added two zeros. You with me? Right, if you take a million times a hundred, not a thousand, a hundred. But I'm going towards a thousand. I want to show you what a thousand does. But, but I'm reasoning you there, right? If you multiply by a hundred, it, it just added two more zeros that weren't there before, right? So then if you multiply by a thousand, it's going to add three zeros. And when you add three zeros, what do you do? You go into the next category. You ever thought about that? Stay up late at night thinking about that? No, again, that's just what the weird math teachers do, right? If you ever take a thousand of any category, it kicks you into the next category. So a thousand million is a billion. Because it has three zeros, right? Which is now category. A thousand billion is a trillion. That's what they're saying. They're just reminding you of that or letting you know that, that a trillion is the same as a thousand million. That is helpful for when you read these big, you know, government charts, because they're all in billions and trillions and thousands and things like that. So, therefore... When they say over here that, when they say over here that 24.6% is on defense, so what does that mean I'm going to do for this question? I'm going to take um, 0.246, the defense, times what? Oh, 2.9 trillion. So how do you turn 2.9 trillion? I'm confused. Oh, they want the answer in billion, don't they? So you got to take that 2.9 trillion and turn it into billion. Not confusing? Yeah. So how's the time? Oh, we're about out of time, huh? Multiply it by a thousand. Yeah, it's going to be 2,900 billion. How do you know? They take this little key right here. One trillion is a, is a thousand billion. So multiply both sides by 2.9. You with me? Multiply the 1 and the 1,000 by 2.9.
So that means 2.9 trillion is 2,900 billion, isn't it? That's why I put 2,900 there. So it's just 2,900 billion? Yep. 2,900 billion, right, is 2.9 trillion. Do you see that? Because remember, the 1,000 kicks you to the next spot. So see, I'm saying 2,000 billion, which is what? 2 trillion, isn't it? Tracking with me? Is it too late for all this reasoning? Multiply that out. You get that answer. The other ones, you just do the angles. So it's 360, right? So you just take 0. 0.246 times 360 for the first one. Then Social Security. What's Social Security? I can't tell. What is it up there? Uh, 0. 0.209. 0. 0.209 times 360. And on you go. And you'll get, you'll get the angles here. Does that make sense? For the angles, it's just times 360. So the trillion billion thing was a little confusing. Oh, yeah. All right. I think we've all had enough. Why don't we stop there? And I'll get this open for y'all. And we'll do a clicker and be done. Uh, oh, it goes off the screen. I don't know. It's weird it does that. This computer, it does it every day. It's what I'm not looking to. It just suddenly vanishes off the screen. So I'm going to have to load it in again. I got your last results, but it's weird it vanishes in between. <coughs> All right. Import. All right, Math 45, Quiz A, put it in there, all right, anywhere, Holy. channel 41, all right, clickers are open, click A for Apple, and we are done.